Hi, Professor Carol J. M. here. In this video, we'll look at frequency distributions and their graphs, why we need them, how to construct them, look at their midpoints, and then figure out how to make graphs from those tables. A frequency distribution is a table that shows the classes or the intervals of our data and a count of their frequency. And this shows you how often something occurs. It's a very important first step in data analysis, the descriptive statistics part, and it helps us to understand what type of distribution the data comes from. Let's consider a couple of examples before we start to uh, work on how to do this ourselves. This is a chart showing a frequency distribution for IQ. And notice the average IQ is 100 there in the middle. And most people cluster close to the average, 100. Some people are a little bit below, some people are a little bit above. Very rarely, there's people like Einstein up at that 165 level. But look what percent of the population that is. It's almost zero. It's so small. This distribution is called the normal distribution or the bell-shaped curve because it reaches a peak in the middle. So when we plot our data, we don't always get a normal distribution curve or a bell-shaped curve. This is a frequency uh, chart that I've created using data from the Centers for Disease Control showing the deaths in the United States in 2015 by age. And this chart shows deaths per 100,000 people. And you can see this is called a negatively skewed distribution. We are very lucky in our modern world. We can expect to die when we're older for the most part. Now, some people, of course, are very unlucky and die young. But uh, for the vast majority of us, you can see by the height of those bars, we can expect to die as we get older not a normal distribution curve, a negatively skewed distribution. This chart shows a frequency distribution created by the United States Census of income distribution in 2014. And we wouldn't expect to see very many people at all making above $206,600 in 2014. And you can see that most people uh, lie between you know, 12,353, although it's not that uncommon to go higher. But it's once you get up to the half a million dollar a year mark, boy, there's not very many people making that kind of money. So this is a positively skewed distribution. So once you've collected your data, typically from a sample, you want to first create a frequency distribution table, and from that we can create a graph. So the procedure is to decide on the number of classes or intervals. The rule of thumb there is to keep it between 5 and 20. If you have too many, it's not helpful. And uh, once you've decided on the number of classes or intervals you want, then you need to calculate your class width. That's the range. The range is simply the highest value in your data. Subtract the lowest, divide by the number of classes, and then round up to the nearest whole number or the nearest uh, decimal place. Find your class limit. So start with the lower, then the net, and it goes up to the lower one plus the class width, etc. You cannot overlap classes. Then you want to count the frequency of values in that interval or class, count the tallies, that'll tell you the frequency, and often you'll want to see the cumulative frequency. So number six is an extra step, step if you want to see the cumulative frequency. Let's do an example. So now we're going to create our own frequency distribution. In this example, we have 40 data points showing the amount spent at a restaurant by couples eating lunch together. And the instructions are, create a frequency distribution with seven classes. So we're going to have to use that value of seven. And as I scan through the data, I see the highest or the maximum largest amount is 61, and the smallest amount is nine. So we want to find the range. And that's the max value minus the min value. That's 52. 
Then in order to find the class width, what we're going to have to do is divide the range 52 by the number of classes, which is 7, and then round up to the nearest convenient number. And this is about 7.43, which I'm going to round up to 8. So our class width is 8. Next, we want to find those class limits. And we're going to start with the minimum data value, or 9. Now, the width is 8. So 9 and 8 is 17, and that's the next lowest value. Add 8 again, so 17. And 8 is 25. And just keep doing that. 25 and 8 is 33. Continue to do that. Now, this has got to come up to 17, but it can't overlap. So the upper here is 16. This has to come up to 25, but it can't overlap. So this is 24. And similarly, this has to come up to 33, but it can't overlap. So we go to 32. Continue to do that until you've got all seven classes. We're going to make a tally mark and tally up all the different numbers. So we want to look and see all the, the values, data values between 9 and 16. There's none in the first row, and there's none in the second row, there's none in the third row, but there is one in the fourth row, and I'm just going to cross that one off. Now, next, we want to look for values between 17 and 24. There's none in the first row, but I see here's 23 in the second row, so that's one tally. And here's 24, so there's another one. In the third row, we have 19. That certainly counts. So there's three so far. And in the fourth row, we have 21. So there's another one, 23. OK, so there's a count of five right there. And that looks like everything in the class 17 to 24. Continue to do that and tally up everything for all of the classes. Once we've tallied everything up, then we count the tallies. So this is obviously just one. Here we have five. And this adds up to 12, 9, 8, 4, and 1. And we, when we add all of the frequencies together, we know we had a total of 40, because we know that we had 40 data points. So n, our number in our sample, is 40. If we want to do the cumulative frequency, we start with the first one, 1, and then we just keep a running total. That's what the cumulative frequency is. So 1 plus 5 is 6, and then 6 and 12 is 18. 18 and 9 is 27. We just keep that running total all the way through. And of course, at the end, we expect it to add up to 40, and it does. So there's our frequency distribution. So now we've created a frequency distribution table, and we even have added a cumulative frequency to the table. Now, how do we get from this point to creating the graph or the bar chart called a histogram? Next, we're going to add some features to the table that will help us understand the data a bit more deeply and also enable us to draw our histogram or graph. The first is the midpoint of the class. So our, for our first class, which is 9 to 16, our midpoint is 9 plus 16, all divided by 2. 25 divided by 2 is 12.5. And for the next class, 17 to 24, add those together, divide by 2, and that gives me 20.5. Notice the difference between the midpoints is 8, the class width. Next, we'll do the relative frequency. So you take the frequency in the class. So for the first class, that's 9 through 16. That's 1 divided by 40. If you put that into your calculator, you'll see that that's 0 0.025. For the next class, 17 to 24, that's 5 divided by 40, and all of that 
uh, if you put that in your calculator, is 0 0.125. You do that all the way down. Now that I've completed my frequency table, I can see some clear patterns in the data. Uh, the average bills between 25 and uh, 40, that's a little over half, and the most frequent amount for a couple is 25 to $32. If I want to draw a histogram or that bar chart, then I'm going to have to rely on the midpoint and either the frequency or the relative frequency. Now we need to input our bars. The first bar is, has a height of 1 and it needs to be centered at 12.5. So it needs to be right centered exactly there and a height of 1 to match the frequency of 1 for that midpoint. Next, we want to have a, uh, a bar where the height is 5. So this one's a little bit too wide and a little bit too tall. We just need to adjust that so it has the appropriate width and height of 5. And once we've completed this process, we see that we have a histogram. What separates a histogram from a normal bar chart is that there is no space between the bars on a histogram. So be sure when you do that, there's no space between the bars. If you wanted to create a frequency polygon instead of a histogram, then at the midpoints, you simply put a dot at the appropriate frequency or height and then connect the dots. A cumulative frequency graph is called an ogive. And it's a line graph that displays the cumulative frequency. So at the midpoints, you can see we start at 1, then we go to 6, then adding them all up, we get to 18, etc., etc. At the final point on the ogive, you should have the n number, which is 40. In summary, we learned to tally up our data to create a frequency table. Then we added midpoint information, calculated relative frequency, we calculated cumulative frequency, and from those columns in our table, we were able to find or create histograms, which is a type of bar graph where the bars touch, frequency polygons, that's a frequency line graph, and finally, we created an ogive, a cumulative frequency line graph. I would like to invite you to like this video and subscribe to this channel. Thanks very much for listening.